Well, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming back. Um. <laughs> we didn't have much choice. <laughs> How many of you have already heard about Network's Mind the Gap campaign? Okay, a good number. Okay, great. How many of you are network members? I forgot to ask that yesterday. That's wonderful. Okay, yeah, we have a lot of overlap, Network and Pax Christi members, including myself, so that's good. Um, we at Network, uh, those of you who know us, know that we're, our main concern is poverty, and we try to advocate for economic justice legislation that affects people who are poor and try to get people out of poverty. And for a long time, we've known that poverty is a problem, but also a problem is the extreme gap between people who are poor and the super wealthy. So um, this year, we decided to do a campaign around the wealth gap, and we started back in May, and um, we came up with this catchy little title, Mind the Gap. Uh, some of you who have been to London might <laughs> recognize that from minding the gap between the platform and the subway. But, uh, <laughs> but we thought it was descriptive. But we wanted people to pay attention, to understand it and pay attention. So it's been mostly an educational campaign to educate people about the wealth gap, uh, how we got here, its consequences. And then now we're trying to move into uh, what uh, my boss Simone keeps calling mend the gap. What can we do about it? Uh, so that's where we're going to move from here. Um, so this is a relatively new workshop. We've done a couple of times. And uh, we'll have some activities. That's why I rearranged the room a little bit. Um, so when we started this campaign in May, we never dreamed that by October, thousands of people would be out in the streets yeah. talking about inequality and the wealth gap. So um, I think we've been pretty successful so far, don't you? <laughs> I mean, it was just great timing. I mean, it's just people understand that this is the root of a lot of problems. And um, I was thrilled to see the, some little mind the gap sign back there uh, about the 1% and the 99%. So um, OK, so mind the gap. Um, what we're going to do, let's see, I think, I, yeah, this will work good. OK, what we're going to do this morning is go through four basic questions. What is the wealth gap? We need to start with definitions. Why does it matter? Why should we be concerned about it? And then how did we get here? And what can we do to fix it? That'll be the last part where I'll need your help, because <laughs> we need more ideas. So first of all, what is wealth? Wealth is the value of everything you own minus what you owe. So your own, your income, your assets, and you owe your debt. So that's the little formula down here. Your income plus your assets minus your debt equals wealth. Now what are assets? What are assets that you might have? House. Property. 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 Inheritance. Inheritance. And the people in the chairs are going to represent the population of the United States. Okay? So we've got 10 people here. Each person is representing 10% of the population of the United States. Now, actually, we're talking, when we talk about wealth, we're talking about household. So you're probably representing 10% of the households in the United States because that's how wealth is measured. Okay, so it turns out that the top 10% of households have 70% of the total wealth. So to demonstrate that, I need somebody who's tall. <laughs> Maybe you're the tallest person? Okay. You get to take up seven chairs, 70% 70 of the wealth. So you have to kick everybody else out and take up. They have to share the other three. <laughs> well, no, so, so you, have to, you have to share the 30%. The rest of you have to share the three chairs. <laughs> no, wait, no, wait, no, come back. We're not done yet. Yeah, go right back. All right, no, yeah. All right, I, I need the, the top 10%. You maybe stretch across all seven of the chairs if you can. 
<laughs> yeah. Tall one. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. These chairs are kind of wide, so I don't know if they're, but uh, they might illustrate another point for us. So see if you can stretch across and claim all seven chairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, because of the kind of chairs that we're using here, sometimes people lay down and can stretch across seven chairs. Um, it looks like he has more wealth than he can even handle. <laughs> okay, so that's the top 10%. The top 1%, what would 10% of your body be? Maybe an arm? <laughs> the top 1% would have three, th over 30% of the total wealth, so your arm alone would take up three chairs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you feel about having this much wealth? Oh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you people down at the bottom? How do you feel? Okay, well, this, this is much too nice of a group to, uh, to generate any conflict among the bottom 90% uh, here, but... Okay, thank you very much. You can... Uh, <laughs> this is before the recession. Um, the top 1% had about 34% of all the wealth. That was, you know, like three chairs, one arm's worth, and the top 10% had 70%. Uh, and then the... Doesn't go quite. But the 66%, this is the bottom 99. If you're looking at the top one versus the bottom 99, and these are the we are the 99 uh, that people are talking about. So the bottom, um, the bottom 90% would have the three chairs. That would be part of that 66%. But the bottom 99 have 66%. Okay, makes sense? And it turns out, this is 2007. In 1976, the top 1% had 22% of the wealth. So you can see how that's grown. Okay, so that's pre-recession. Okay, now this is 2009 data. Uh, so this is post-recession. And this chart's a little bit different because it shows the, tries to show the one and the 90 and the, uh, but if we look at the blue section there, that's the top 1% that had 34% before. They've gone up to 35.6%. So their share of the wealth has increased. Now because of the recession, the total wealth of the US has gone down because the value of people's houses has gone down and, and stuff like that, and investments. But the share of the total for the top 1% has gone up in those two years. And then the next 9% is the red, so the red and the blue together would be the top 10%. Uh, so they've actually got more than 70% by now. And the bottom 90 has about 25%. So that's our wealth distribution pretty much currently. Um, now again, as with numbers for the federal budget, calculating wealth can be a little bit tricky. Um, we found a couple different organizations that calculated different ways. Some people leave out, they don't count the value of retirement plans because you don't actually own those. So um, you may see some different numbers, but basically the percentages hold up no matter how you figure it. Now where this gets especially dramatic is when we look at the racial wealth gap. Um, again, this is household median, meaning half the households own more and half own less. Um, look at the difference between African American, Latino, and white. Now again, this data is from, uh, most of these slides we got from United for a Fair Economy. They've been working on this for a long time, so they uh, shared their information with us and we put it together in, in this workshop. So this slide is from United for a Fair Economy, who got their wealth calculations from the Pew Research. Uh, so it's, as you can imagine, it might be tricky to try and figure all this out. Uh, on our website, if, if some of you have seen the uh, Mind the Gap part of our website, we have a lot of stuff on there about the racial wealth gap. And we actually have a chart. We use numbers from the Economic Policy Institute, and they did not include the value of retirement plans and a couple other things. 
in their numbers are um, the African American median wealth would be 2,200, you know, half of, of what that is, and uh, the white was 97, 900. So it's still the proportion of the chart would still be the same, even if you use different numbers. What is power? Well, it's a difficult thing to describe. I like this guy's definition. He says, power is the ability to realize wishes or reach goals even in the face of opposition. More simply, power is about having the ability to get what you want. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not saying that power is bad. In fact, I'm all for people getting what they want. A living wage, a safe neighborhood, good schools, clean environment, vacations, policies that serve them, you know. The problem is when there's an imbalance of power so big that only some people, the powerful ones, are able to get what they want and the rest of us are denied even the opportunity to try. Still with me? Back to the first point. What does wealth have to do with power? Let's ask this guy again. Wealth is a resource for exercising power. I like money, you probably like money, most people do. So if you have something I want, you'll probably get it from you if I offer you some of my money. So that's fine if what it is is an iPod, a necklace, or a cookie, but what if you're a politician and what I want is for you to exercise your power to give me tax breaks? Or what if you're the president of a university and what I want is for you to let in my little sister even though she's not qualified? Or what if you're a scientist and what I want is for you to use your credentials to misrepresent data so my factory doesn't get shut down? Certain kinds of wealth, for example stocks, can be used to control corporations. And corporations can have huge impacts on the surrounding society. These can be either positive or negative impacts. They can employ or fire a lot of people. They can compete or outcompete with small local businesses, protect or destroy the environment, pay taxes or find loopholes, and set the standards and working conditions to be fair or exploitive. Wealth doesn't only really make the wealthy powerful, it can make the non-wealthy non-powerful. The wealthy are able to fund political campaigns, think tanks, research, lobbyists, and propaganda that serves their interests. The more money behind something, the more noise it makes. And that can block out the people and ideas that best serve the majority. Too often it feels that the agenda is set by wealthy individuals who can fund the politicians, policies, and ideas that are in line with their own interests. Think about it. Who benefits the most from the Bush tax cuts? Who benefits from Citizens United? Who is the most to lose from recognizing and addressing the fact that global warming exists and is an urgent problem? And who is the means and motive to defy the majority in popular opinion in all of these instances? Why, over the past 30 years, have 90% of Americans had to pay higher health care and energy costs, put up with reduced benefits and higher taxes, and yet seen no significant increase in their actual wages? It's no wonder that barely half of us use our vote, or that politics is so partisan these days. The wealth gap is a power gap. It means more debt, illness, working hours, corruption. It means more union busting, stress, working hours. It means more jails, corruption, and union busting. Plus social mobility, life expectancy, and leisure time. And so today, we're overworked, but have to consider ourselves lucky enough to have a job. We've got more African-American men in prison, on parole, or on probation than we had enslaved in 1850. And women still only get 77 cents to every dollar that a man earns. These are issues of power, perpetuated and enforced by wealth inequality. The inequality denies us all opportunities and is inherited by the next generation. The problem is not that wealth is inherently bad, but that wealthy people are corrupt or greedy. The problem is the inequality and how that inequality translates into a gap in power, economic, political, and social power, to realize what the bottom 90% of us want. And the wealth gap actually affects everyone negatively. It weakens and erodes our society's health, opportunities, and democracy. We know that this wealth gap is happening and that it's getting worse. So now we have to ask ourselves, is this what we want? Yeah, uh, one of the things, Paige does talk fast, and she's, I mean, you could see the passion and the excitement in her, and she was really excited about this, and, uh, um, so did she convince you that you should care about it, that you should mind the gap? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's how it relates to politics, is, is the power piece of it. Okay, so now that we know uh, what it is and why it matters, Let's go back and in order to figure out what to do about it, we kind of need to start with, well, how did we get here? So we're going to do another little activity. And for this one, I'm going to need five volunteers. We don't have to sit in the chairs. Five people just come up in the front. 
Okay, now um, we're going to talk about income. We're going to switch from wealth for a minute to talk about income, because as you can imagine, income produces wealth. And um, so this, how we got here was to see how the income patterns have grown over the past years. So we're going to look at two different periods in the United States and see how income has grown for different households. Now this time, when economists talk about income, um, they like to talk about quintiles. Quintiles is like one-fifth of the population, so that's why we only have, need five people for this one. So um, one, they kind of line up everybody and divide up into five, and then the people who make the least income, the bottom 20%, that's going to be you. Okay. So your annual income is from zero to 26. <laughs> okay. And then the second quintile, the... Uh, going up the scale, 20%, uh, from 26 to 47,000 annual income, about. And then the middle quintile, middle 20%, 47 to 73. So you're, if you'll notice, your situation's getting a little brighter than these blue people down here. <laughs> um, the fourth quintile, uh, kind of bright, uh, 73. And then the top 20% top 20 <laughs> Okay. So the top 20% of, again, uh, households would be 112.50 and up. And we'll talk about end up in a little bit. Okay, so who are these people? What kind of people would make up to 26? 934. People at McDonald's, if they were lucky. Service person. Service? Public laborers. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you are? That's right. Thank you. Beginning teacher. Beginning teacher? That's right. That's right. That's what I make. Chaplain. Social worker. Social worker. Social worker. What about the second 20%? I can tell you if you work for a nonprofit Catholic social justice lobby, you you'd are. be in that range. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, Who else would be in there? Not for profits. Not profits, yeah. probably. Yeah. Uh, okay. What about the middle? Um, uh, management. Middle management. Middle management. Engineers. Good salespeople. Yeah, and some of these, some of the small business or the good salespeople might even move, be moving up to that fourth 20%, right? The yeah. 73. <laughs> okay, and who's in the top 20? The top 20 attorneys. 112,000? Some. Some Oh, I kind of skipped, yeah. I, you skipped him. 70 to. Vice presidents. University, uh, university professors. Professors, yeah. yeah. Untenured. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then what about the top? College president. Everybody else. College <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> NFL. Yeah. 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 Everybody yeah. with yeah. NFL. Virtually every executive in corporate America wears. Right. 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 Hmm. Every CEO. And entertainers. Oh. Every physician. Lawyers. Dentists. Attorneys. Bishops. <laughs> okay, well, I think we got the idea of who these people are. Okay, so now um, we're going to create a little human chart here, and I think it might be better to like move over to this, where there's an aisle here. We're going to have you walk down the aisle. So a bunch over here, like in front of the screen. Keep in order here. Okay, now we're going to start with the bottom. So we're going to look at the income trends from the period of 1979 to 2009 for roughly the last 30 years. So the bottom quintile, the bottom 20%, do, uh, what do you think happened to their income in those 30 years? Yeah. Went down, went, down went up. Yeah. 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 What's the time frame? 1979 to 2009. Okay, it turns out the lowest 
every income for the lowest quintile in those 30 years actually went down 7%. So I'm going to ask um, you to take, we're going to, what we're going to do is uh, they're going to walk to represent the, the percent here. So we're going to, each step means 5%. So the bottom, I'm going to ask you to step back one and a half steps, just to step move backwards. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay. So we're creating this graph now, okay. Okay, so the second 20%, um, their income in the last 30 years or so is increased by about 4%. So you can take about one step forward. Okay. And then the middle, your income has increased about 11%. So you can take two steps forward. And the fourth highest, your income has increased about 23%, so that translates to about four and a half steps forward. Okay, and then the highest quintile, your income has increased 49%. So, 10 steps forward. <laughs> 10, that's 10, that's, okay, good. Okay, now, can you see this little bar graph that we created here? So you can see what had the income growth in the last 30 years, the human bar graph. Okay, now we're going to look at that top 20% a little bit more. So can I have two more volunteers to go over there and stand with? <laughs> okay, one more. <laughs> okay, so I get to talk loud. I my phone won't work here, but okay. So the, this group of three now represents the top twenty percent, the top quintile. Um, and no, you keep that. Okay. We're going to break that down. You are the top five percent of households in the country who make more than two hundred thousand dollars. These are the, you're the ones that Obama wants to tax more. Okay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you are the top 1%. Oh. Top 1% makes 1,200,000. Okay. That's right. Well, uh, see, it makes sense. Okay, so starting from, where, starting from where you were with 10 steps ahead of these people, um, the top 5%... Your income in the past 30 years increased 73%. So you're only at 49. So you need to take five and a half more steps beyond where she is. Top 5%. In the top 1%, <laughs> you're exactly right. Your, your income has increased 170%. So, you, so starting here, you need to take 24 more steps. <laughs> I think you're out on the patio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so let's look at another period in our history, another approximately 30 year period. And this is right after World War II, the period of 1947 to 1979. Uh, this is, again, we're talking about real family income growth for the different quintiles. Um, and if we were going to demonstrate this, we'd have our five people up here, and they'd all be taking approximately the same amount of steps forward at the same time, rather than this big disparity. Isn't it? Pre-Reagan. <laughs> In fact, the top 5% actually did not increase as much as Okay, which leads us to wonder, what happened? What changed? Have any ideas? When did Reagan get elected? When, when, did he be, when did he become president and start making policies? 81. Okay, this started before that, unfortunately. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so what's, what's happened in the last uh, 30 years that could account for this big difference? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of variables. Yeah, yeah. The the jobs. Um. Yeah. This is actually the period when the CEO salary started to to really rise, and I don't know what really accounts for that. Um. <laughs> the what? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, There's also a radical increase in consumer bad decisions, which are probably manipulated too. So I would say that ra the radical decrease in regulations, mm -hmm. uh, just look what's going on with student loans, the devastations. Yeah. Uh, so the people, many people at the bottom simply made poor decisions that were taken advantage of. Yeah. Didn't have yeah, and, and credit. Uh, Credit is a big piece of this. We have some stuff on our website about credit. And credit, the, it was easier to get credit during this period. So that's why it wasn't obvious that there was this big disparity, because the people that, whose incomes weren't rising were borrowing to make up for it. And so now it's just becoming apparent with the uh, recession and the housing crisis and stuff like that, that we had way too much debt, and now we can see the big disparity. Um, the, Period of 1947 and 1979, the post-war period, the goal of the government was to create and build a middle class. And so we had things like the GI Bill that helped people buy houses and helped them get educated. Um, and they were funded by relatively high tax rates on people at the top. Now, it's important to note that the GI Bill didn't help everybody. If we go back and look at that racial wealth gap, we know that that didn't really help um, minorities. And then from 1979 to 2009, roughly starting with Reagan, but the trend really started before that, um, some other variables. Um, it seemed like the goal of government then was to let the rich accumulate great capital in the belief that it would trickle down. Remember that, trickle down economics? Um, so different ideas. So at the top, um, this top 1%, top 5%, a lot of their income comes from assets or investments that they're creating um, income on. And that gets back to, they didn't really work for it. They just accumulated all this money and invested it and get, get money that way. And, and they're probably the property owners, rental income, stuff like that. Um, so these are the things we need to look at, the policy changes that reinforce the power shift to the top. Um, the anti-union climate became harder to organize. Um, trade treaties benefited mostly corporations, not so much workers. Taxes, uh, the taxes on investments have really gone down from where they were. Public services are being cut. That's affecting the workers in the lower quintiles. And then the minimum wage. Uh, you know, we said income was a big part of building wealth, and if the minimum wage isn't keeping up, let's, let's jump ahead here. Um, these are the, the values of the minimum wage versus the living wage. In 1968, the minimum wage was 94% of the living wage. 1979, it was 81%, dropping a little bit. In 2009, minimum wage is only 68% of the living wage. So even though there's been little increments in the minimum wage, it hasn't kept up with where it should be. Yes, and what we've ended up with is a wheel of misfortune. <laughs> and you could start wherever you want on here. Maybe start with uh, decline in political participation leads to power shift to corporations and big investors, exactly what you're talking about. And they have the power to affect the policy and make the cha change the rules that favor them, which results in greater economic inequality, which results in big money in politics, longer work hours for the people at the bottom, rising personal debt, starting to get credit, which results in decline in political participation, and we get all those things in the middle. Um, so what if we want, what would a wheel of shared prosperity, this doesn't have quite the ring as a wheel of misfortune, but <laughs> um, again, we could start anywhere here. Broadly shared prosperity would lead to more time for democracy and meaningful elections, stronger unions, political participation, kind of the opposite of what we had before, rule changes that benefit everyone. So this is the part where we talk about how do we get from here 
to here. And I think this may be a good time to talk about what the things that you wanted to bring up about the corporation thing.